Good morning. I trust you all remember me. But a hundred years from now, who will? Can any of you name your great grandparents? Hands up if you can. That's good. Yeah, so some. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, I had to do some digging. I have a picture. This is actually my dad's. Where's my pointer? There it is. Big guy right here. Lawson Vance Earls is my dad's great grandfather. So we're guessing this is like 1890, 95, somewhere around then. Fascinating. What I really want to know is who Bill Earls is in Susie, Virginia. Honestly, family, I don't know anything about these and neither does my dad. We don't know anything about them. You know, people say pictures are worth a thousand words, but the age of words has far exceeded the age of photography, hasn't it? And there's something about this grainy photograph that also emphasizes that, the lack of resolution. It's unclear. We don't remember. These people had lives. I don't know where Mac Earls ended up. They all have lives. They all have stories. They all wanted to be remembered in some way. But here we are in 2024, and we're finishing up our study of the book of Nehemiah, which has been a story of restoration, but it's also been a story about Nehemiah. It's been his memoir. It's been his memories. And in the passage today, he's going to talk a fair bit about how he wants to be remembered. We have seen Nehemiah to be a man of prayer, a man of action. You remember, right away, chapter 1. A man of humility, a man of courage. He's been an extraordinarily generous man. We're going to see today in no uncertain terms and also a very demanding one. A remarkable leader. In some ways, though, today, he comes unhinged. He gets more than a little raw. And there's some reasons for that. But I want to hone in on, in particular, why he goes on and on about how he wants to be remembered, especially by God. And I want us to see in this passage that when Nehemiah keeps saying, remember me, there's something that God is trying to draw our hearts and attention to. There's a cry inside of us that would say the same, maybe not the words he would use, but we have the exact same desire. We have the exact same need. None of us wants to be forgotten, do we? Though we actually all will be. But not by God. But not by God. So with that, let's look at Nehemiah 13. And it begins with these words, on that day. What day is this? It's the day that Josh was talking about when he preached to us gloriously through chapter 11 and 12. The day of celebration and worship. It was the high point of the book of Nehemiah. It was the high point of their effort to restore the walls, to restore worship, to restore the temple worship, and the singers, and the Levites, and the gatekeepers, and everybody's roles and positions. And the choirs were singing, and they're standing on the walls, and it was glorious. And now we have chapter 13. So I just want a fair warning. Nehemiah's memoirs here take a very personal and a very sharp turn. And it's a mix of flashback and rapid fire recounting of wicked regression. I thought carefully about that word, but that's exactly what's happening. Wicked regression. And how Nehemiah tries to respond. You know, Eric and I and the team, when we meet and talk about the sermon Thursdays, Eric was like, this is like a bad screenwriting Nehemiah. It's like a Hollywood movie. You're supposed to end happy endings, right? We all love happy endings. Well, 11 and 12 would have been great. Why does it end with 13? We'll get, we'll get into that. Uh, just fair warning, as I said, it's pretty much a downer the rest of the way out. <laughs> it's like, I get to preach this one. Josh, come back here, you preach this. Like, <laughs> it's pretty much a dance rough. So I just want to encourage you, though, Buckle up, stay with me, 
because there's a remarkable hope embedded in this passage at the end, and it centers on Nehemiah's plea to God to remember me. So again, it starts, on that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found that written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. So as soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain and wine and oil which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. Remember, Nehemiah is speaking. This is first person account. Okay? He's, he's writing his memories. I was not there. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. He went back. So remember, he had been freed from Artaxerxes, gave him permission, and it was what, 40, 45 BC, to go to Jerusalem, to do what he did. It was about 12 years, and then he goes back to serve him. We don't know how many years it was since he came back to Jerusalem, but he comes back. Okay, so there's this gap. And after some time, I asked leave of the king, Artaxerxes, and came back to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense Okay, pause. So I gave you fair warning, right? This is already whoop, going downhill. What is going on here? Nehemiah has been away for some time and returns to find what? Next chart. <laughs> I did this on, on purpose because I'm like, how can I make the chart as offensive as possible? And I thought a 210 font would get your attention. It's like... Tobiah in the house of God. Who is this guy? Tobiah, if you've not been with us in our study, this is the 12th time-ish that he has been mentioned. He is an Ammonite. He is not part of Israel. And he's living in the temple where they were supposed to keep the supplies, the grain, the offerings for the Levites, the singers, the priests, the gatekeepers, all those people that didn't celebrating, they all got thrown out. Turns out, we'll read the next passage, or we'll see, you'll see in the next passage, they all went back to their fields because there was nothing for them. And they had to make a living. This guy is camped out in the, in the house of God. Tobiah rears his ugly head here yet again, as he has been doing throughout Nehemiah. The next chart I just did, I've mentioned this to you guys a couple of times. If you have any Bible app whatsoever, this is the free ASV study. You can type in the search a word, and I did, Tobiah. They're the verses. So you can see them. There's a dozen times he appears in, maybe he's an important character in Nehemiah. There's no maybe. He is. Why? What is the deal with Tobiah? He's in my face. Tobiah and his partner in crime, Sanballat, who also appears at the end of this chapter, represent the enemies. Not just the enemies then, the enemies now. They represent the enemies of our souls, the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is what's pictured here. Today, listen, today we put our faith in Christ. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us. Let me ask you, do you make room in your temple for a Tobiah? Do you clear out a room that belongs to the Lord and for his contributions and allow something of the world or the flesh or the devil to reside there. That is what is being talked about. That is what this passage is for. This is not just ancient history. It is that. But it means something to us. 
Tobiah should not be in our hearts, should not be in our temples. But let's be honest, he is, isn't he? And I want to be careful here, but I do want to challenge you because there's many of us that will go straight to of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Oh, it's the devil. The devil's doing this, the devil's doing that. The devil does not need much help when it's the world and the flesh involved as well. I just want to point that out. Let us be sensitive to these Tobias because they rear their ugly heads in our lives. Let us not allow them to live inside us. This, the reason I wanted to hammer this is because it helps us now, let's go back to the history. Nehemiah chucks his furniture out. Like, I mean, this was probably not pleasant. Throughout this passage, I wish we had a little more detail <laughs> on some of these things. It just says he threw them out. We need to throw Tobiah out. There's a place and time to be throwing out the wicked. Do you understand that? We need to be a little more vigorous in our responses sometimes. We need to be a little bit more diligent. Dare I say rude. Dare I say impertinent in some way. You out to my flesh. You out to the world. You out to the demonic that would attempt to say, no, no, I have a place here in your house. Right. No. Are you with me? Yes. This is what this is about. Can you not also think as Nehemiah is cleaning out Tobiah's crap and bringing back what belongs there, what Jesus did when he arrived in this temple 400 years later, it says it. The next passage, Matthew 21, was one of the examples. Jesus entered the temple and he drove out. He drove them out. This was not polite. Oh, I'm sorry. You shouldn't be exchanging money here anymore. Can you please not trade this? Get out! With a whip. Jesus meek and mild. We are meant to make the connection between these cleansings. We are meant to see what he did. Again, there is a time and a place for throwing out the wicked because our bodies are his temple. Next, we see Nehemiah recounts a series of three times that he found or saw something wrong so that's the first cycle, piece of the cycle. Then he confronts people about it in very sharp and very unpleasant ways. You can go to the next one, Becca. And pleads to God to remember. So this is the cycle. I found, I saw, I confronted, remember. Okay, I'm not going to read them all because we don't have the time. But I'm going to ask you again, can you please take the time to go through scripture on your own family? If the only time you're hearing or reading the scriptures on Sunday morning, it is like, the only time you look at yourself in a mirror. Would you look at yourself in a mirror once a week? Boy, I hope you make changes then at least, right? <laughs> like, well, we check every day. Same with the word. You need to be checking. You need to be looking. So I want to, you, you should be looking to see if what I said and what Josh said and what Pat said, what Eric says, what Peter said is actually what the scripture says. So you need to read it. But for time for today, here's the structure. I found first they neglected the house of God. This is very consistent. Apparently, Eliashib, who was the high priest at the time, made way for a Tobiah. Got rid of the uh, things that they were gathering to provide for people. Despite, do you remember this? Despite their explicit commitment in chapter 10, which Eric preached to us in no uncertain terms, we will not neglect what? The house of, the house of God. What are they doing? Why is the house of God forsaken, Nehemiah says. He restores the collection distribution, and then he just says this, remember me, oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Cycle two, verse 15 through 22. In those days I saw, what? Summary, people profaning the Sabbath. Okay, quick reminder, what is the Sabbath? Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, livestock, all of them, 
because it is holy to the Lord. The Lord has blessed it and made it holy. It is, in Exodus 31, it says, the sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given to you so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. The Sabbath was not just about checking a box and not doing work. It was about representing God, as is everything in this list. And you may recall, this was also, in chapter 10, one of the things that they explicitly said they were going to do. Chapter 10, verse 31 And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them. What are they doing? (laughs) They're buying. They're inviting it. I mean, it's crazy. Nehemiah confronted, it says, the nobles of Judah. And I'll just read excerpts. What is this evil thing that you were doing, profaning the Sabbath? Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on the city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And he goes on. He makes sure the gates are closed. He commands the doors to be shut. He stationed his servants at the gates. I love this bit. The merchants and the sellers lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. Let's try to weasel our way back in here again. It echoes this Tobiah and the room again, doesn't it? Here they come. We're just going to loiter here, linger. Can we actually get in? And then he goes, I love this. But I warned them, verse 21, and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. I mean, Celeste said it Thursday, Nehemiah's getting heavy. He must have been, I, because they responded. Like, these were not empty threats. It said they did not do it again. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Mission accomplished. Kind of? Kind of? I mean, what's sad is he's having to do this again. They had just committed to this. I don't know how long ago it was. Chapter 10. And here they are selling and disregarding and what the scripture says, profaning the Sabbath. Okay, so our time. Oh boy. I don't know what Sabbath observance must look like, but it's not nothing. And I want you to let that sit. And I want to encourage you to go to the Lord with that because it's about distinction It is about showing we are his. It's about emphasizing that our trust is in him and not our abilities to do work and to accomplish our objectives and to move things forward. Family, I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. We need to rest. The Lord has ordained it. Six days the Lord took to make it. Learn in the Genesis study. Go join it, ladies. One day, God rested, then we should. I don't know what it looks like, but it should look like something. Let us not be said of us that we profane it and that we dis- disregard it. Third cycle, verse 23, 29. In those days I also saw, oh boy, intermingling with pagan foreigners, false gods, and wicked ways. That's my summary. Again, despite their explicit commitment in chapter 10, verse 30, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Okay, this one is tricky. So I'm going to get into the text a little bit more. Stay with me. Verse 23. In those days, the Jews, he saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod and Moab and Ammon and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. Do you remember we already heard Ammon and Moab? At the beginning, this this chapter seems to be bracketed by an emphasis on foreign engagement. And I want to emphasize here, we need to understand what the scripture is saying on its terms, not ours. And we bring our 21st century minds to it. And we're like, what the heck? What's the big deal? I mean, is this xenophobia? No, it is not. What does it mean 
when it says Ammonite and Moabite. Those things meant something to these people. Here's at least a glimpse at what it means. I want you to be shocked because you should. These people were notorious for the way they worshiped their false gods. And do you know what they did? They burned their children as sacrifices in fire. That is how they were mainly known. So, you're going to intermarry with them? You're going to invite that kind of value system, that religious, to the point that your children are not even speaking Hebrew, can't read the Torah, the law, can't follow. The, how is that faithfulness? This gets a little bit of picture of why, honestly, Nehemiah goes ballistic. He confronts them. Verse 25, he cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Josh should come and preach this. Like I, like, I want to preach last week. I want to do this week. Again, I think it would help us to pause and understand culturally. There are some things I cannot justify. And by the way, I am not going to justify his behavior. The scripture doesn't comment on it. It just says it. This is important too. So that we don't latch on to scriptures and say, oh, this is somehow okay for our mode of ministry or our mode of parenting. No, it's not. It doesn't say anything about that. It says what happens. But I will say this. When he's talking about pulling out hair, it was a very common expression of deliberate um, desecration and, and essentially mockery publicly. And it was usually with respect to someone's beard. You pull out, the, you grab someone by the face, pull their hair out. I know that sounds awful. Scripture says he did it. And he was doing it publicly to mock them, to call them out for this wicked regression. I know it's awful. I know it offends our 21st century sensibilities. But the action was designed to show anger and express the insult, to make his points. Then he goes on, I don't have time to read it, but he goes on at length about Solomon as a rationale. He's not just flying off the handle. It isn't pure play, angry, losing it. He's reasoning with them, and he reasons with them. Look at Solomon. Solomon loved many former men. I know we don't all know the story of Solomon, briefly. He was one of the most famous kings of Israel. God loved him, the scripture says. God gave him a unique wisdom. Nonetheless, 1 Kings 11, go read it. He loved many foreign women, including Ammonites and Moabites. And they turned his heart, the scripture says, they turned his heart away from the Lord. He began to love their gods. The kingdom under him immediately, the next generation, was devastatingly divided and never recovered. They're experiencing the fruit of that now. They're all following his example, and they have been generation after generation, leading to their exile, leading to their current condition. So this is Nehemiah's plea to them. How can you do this again? Are any of you as wise and loved as Solomon? And yet look at him. Nehemiah is coming unhinged because they were supposed to be holy and distinct, representing God and set apart to reflect him. It gives us at least some semblance of an understanding of why his response was so vehement, why it's so offensive. Then he ends in this third cycle, he says, remember them, O God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Oof. Do you remember there was a period in his prayers, Nehemiah was a man of prayer, one of the prayers in chapter four was specifically a prayer for judgment. Here he is appealing that God remember for judgment. So Nehemiah then summarizes in verse 30 and 31, this brings us to the end of the chapter and the end of the book. Thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. 
Remember me, oh my God, for good. Says, thus I cleansed, I established, I provided. I imagine him saying things like this. I tried to warn them. I did what I could. When he comes to the end, it's like, God, you're seeing all this, right? Man of prayer, man of action, humility, courage. But it's a downer. Because he was gone for a little while. And look at the mess. It's like the, you remember the uh, Pixar movie, The Incredibles? When they do the cameo picture of Mr. Incredible at the front end, he's like, can you keep it clean for 10 minutes? Like this, uh, if the superhero's not there, things go to pot. Well, that's what happened. Why does Nehemiah end this way? Oh, this is what we must get, family. This has been a story of restoration, but also a story about Nehemiah, a memoir of his memories. But do you see where this story is concluding? It's not where we have wanted or hoped, and if we had been the Hollywood screenwriter, it would have been 11 and 12. It's here. It's with this plea, a plaintive cry, a plea to God. Remember me, O God, for good. Let me ask you, is their restoration full? Is it complete? Is it sound? Evidently not. Far from it. And why is that? Is it Nehemiah's fault? Remember they confessed as a people. Nehemiah confessed on behalf of his people. They're all flawed. They're all unfaithful. Nehemiah is a hero. I don't want to minimize him and I don't think we should in 13 when we see him come unhinged just think, oh, not this guy. Let's go find a better biblical hero. Family, the heroes are all there for a reason and they're, for us to, they're there for us to see them warts and all. Nehemiah comes to the end of his life and his work and all the things that he could have said at the end of this memoir and at the end of this book, this is what he says. Remember me Oh my God, for good. So now I want to ask you this question. Did God answer Nehemiah? Does he remember, does he remember us? Because remember what I said at the beginning, isn't this one of the deepest cries of our own hearts? Who of us wants to be forgotten? Don't we want to be remembered? Did God answer Nehemiah? Flash forward 400 years, which during which time, by the way, God was largely silent. And Israel largely suffered the same thing we just read. I don't know the history well, but I do know enough that most of that time looked like chapter 13. Changed who was over them, the Romans ultimately. 400 years later, we come to another unlikely hero, deeply flawed, hanging, in fact, on a cross next to Jesus. And listen as this flawed hero echoes Nehemiah's cry. Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanging railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him. Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I want us to see that the story of Nehemiah and the way that it ends, all the darkness and the discouragement and the repeated failure and the anger and the adequacy are meant to drive us to cry the same cry. This man hanging on the cross had nothing. 
Remember we talked about God's covenant mercy? Mercy is help to someone who has no right or claim. This is an audacious request. Remember me? Why should Jesus remember you? You're a thief getting what you deserve. I don't think Nehemiah was saying, remember me, O God, for my good based on all the things he had done. I think he came to the end and realized, it's not enough. There's no way. And he falls back on the, unf- on the faithfulness of God, his steadfast love. That's what is taking place here. I think Nehemiah came face to face with the shame of human nature, his own and his people's, the fallibility. Doesn't this passage bring that into a sharp light for us? Family, we must feel the hopelessness. We must go through the darkness in order for the light to be compelling to us. In in order for the gospel, the good news that Jesus has come, that God has answered the prayer, that he has remembered us in our lowest state. We must go through that for that to mean something to us. Though we so richly deserve to be forgotten, God does not forget us. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. What did Jesus say? We all know. He said to him, truly, I say to you, truly, I guarantee it. Today, you, you will be with me in paradise. How do we know God did not forget Nehemiah, his people, and us? How do we know that he answered his prayer to remember? Here is God's answer. Hanging right next to the last flawed hero who represents all of us. And the answer is not just a word. The answer is the word made flesh. Dwelling among us. Jesus, God with us, living our life, dying our death because he took upon himself the sins of the world. He is the one and the only hero in all scripture who is not sinful, who is not finite, who is not limited, and most certainly does not come up short. That is what this is meant to drive us to. He is doing it. And do you know how he's doing it? I don't have time to unpack the crucifixion. But do you remember? Jesus gave his own face to spitting. Isaiah 50, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Jesus enters into our darkness more than we can possibly imagine because we have no right, rightful clue of what kind of wrath we actually deserve. And I'm, I mean that personally, I mean that collectively. I know that's offensive, family. I'm sorry, it's scripture. And I want you to hear it and get through it and realize God has answered and not forgotten us and not forgotten you. Jesus is our great and holy high priest who entered the world to throw out the wicked to throw out Satan, to throw out sin, to wash us clean, making us members of his temple, his body, giving us a Sabbath rest that we could not attain for ourselves, Hebrews says. He is the faithful husband who literally comes after us even in our deep adultery and in our unfaithfulness, our broken vows, and he insists, I will remain faithful to you. That is the steadfast love, the covenant love that he keeps. It's his great mercy to us who have no right or claim to it. But listen, the story there in our restoration, as well as theirs, it doesn't end with asking God to remember us. Nehemiah said, remember me, O God, for my good. He does, I just showed you. He does, but that's not the end. Do you know that God says this to us today? This is the last thing I want to share. God says to you, 
remember me. Remember me. Literally. Guys, his memories, all his work done in faithfulness, Psalm 33 says, all this time has been professionally recorded, has been sovereignly and supernaturally ordained and captured in the scripture. These are his memories, and he asks us to remember him. This is why I plead with you, get in it. Struggle through it. Ask for help. These are his memories. Let's look at them. Let us weigh them. Let us feel them. Let us revel in the goodness of them. He has given us his word. He's given us Jesus, his word made flesh. He's given us his Holy Spirit to remind us of all that he's said and done, the scripture says. And he literally says, he literally says, remember me. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 11. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me.